as the deep and it falls, the water is so my soul thirst after thee. You alone are my heart's desire and long to work. As the but um, do you mind just spending a, a, a few moments in, in sharing? Uh, because you work for the United Nations and you are a Russian interpreter, and you know, there's you interpret other languages besides Russian, right? From French yeah, as well, and French also. Uh, what has been, matter of fact, I was going to tell you this Tuesday, either this Tuesday or next Tuesday. Um, on the radio show, I would absolutely love to interview you because what you you are in a very unique position uh, in, in in what you do besides being a pastor and a husband. Um, you you have a very unique position in being that you are in the center of many of of, of, of the international issues that we're not aware of. How's things going over there? Uh, well, there have been a number of different issues the last few years that make the situation more complicated. So, you know, you know, there, you, you know Syria and you know what's been going on the last week or so. So it, it's, um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it, the, politically it's, yeah, it is a very tense situation. And I don't know how this particular one is going to work out. But I, 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 if you'd like to set up some kind of, uh, some kind of interview, that's, that, that's fine. Um, there, there is. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. They might not be agreeing, but they're communicating. Right. Uh, the issue on this particular one is, uh, well, the the latest issue on Ukraine and Crimea is, if Crimea says they want to join Russia, is that uh, legal under international law? So there will be different viewpoints uh, expressed. I, I think the legal, legally, the. I think the real solution is political or diplomatic, you know, rather than you know trying to split legal hairs because you're going to have some people say that it's it's okay to decide to join another country, and other people will say it's not okay to decide to join another country. So I think it comes down to just uh, some kind of political, uh, me like mediation and political solution. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. And similar to even what Jean taught today, um, you know, I'm, I'm very ignorant when it comes to knowing international issues. I've just never been interested in it nor versed in it. But the older I get, now that I know you, my my in, my intrigue is just, and, and I, I can't believe everything I read because everything that I read comes from so many different areas that yeah, of course. I don't know what truth is anymore. Yeah, and the thing is, uh, so many things are going on now in the world that it's just, you, you, you appreciate more, you know, prophecy, that it really things are lining up in the world exactly the way the Bible said that they would, you know, and it's just, uh, it's it's amazing to, uh, to, to to watch it, and I feel really blessed that, you know, God has put me in, in, in that situation to observe it uh you know, for first time, even though it's even though it puts pressure on me because of my faith as a Christian, it's still uh, it's still a, a great blessing that God has given to me, and I'm very thankful for it. Wonderful. Well, thank you, sir. Now it's your time. Feel free to take an hour. Uh, yeah, I probably I probably I don't. Uh, you to take. Okay, th I, I probably uh, don't uh, don't need that, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll see. We'll just see how it goes. Thanks very much, uh, and thank you, uh, Father, very much for this. Uh, this ministry and uh, all of the teachers and, and what, what they have to say, how they uh, contribute to our knowledge and our development, and bless this message to your service as well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Through that, so we just know what the story is and, uh, you know, some of the things that God is trying to tell us in that particular chapter, and then broaden the discussion a little bit to... to take in uh, the veil. So uh, chapter 2 verse 1, then after 14 years I again went up to Jerusalem taking along Barnabas and Titus and I went up according to a revelation. So uh, Paul is uh, sharing here that he got this uh, you know through prayer and through uh, some, some revelation from, from the Holy Spirit. And I presented the gospel to them which I am proclaiming to the heathens uh, unbelievers, but privately to those reputed to be of influence, lest I would run, or did run, in vain. Uh, 
So that's the thing about witnessing. It's good to witness to one person, but how much better is it if you witness to that one person and then that one person runs off and tells a whole bunch of other people and then maybe, you know, 10 people that, you know, all of a sudden have eternal life through faith in Christ. So he wanted to go, go privately to those reputed to be of influence to uh, proclaim the good, good news, believe in Jesus Christ, that he died for your sins, he shed his blood for your sins, and you have eternal life. That's it. It's, it can't, can't be canceled, can't be changed. But even Titus, who was with me, although he was Greek, uh, not Jewish, was not compelled to be circumcised. And that's, that's another uh, point that's going to come up later in the chapter. It's an important point, is that, uh, as you know, at eight days of age, there's a ritual circumcision done to Jewish babies, male babies. Um, Gentiles are not um, obligated to be circumcised. Uh, if a Gentile wants to be circumcised, it's my understanding is that that uh, commits that person to the Mosaic Law. That's pretty much go, goes hand in hand. It's one of the qualifications for uh, for the Mosaic Law. But as a non-Jewish believer, you are not you're not obligated um, to to do that. But the subject came up because of false brothers. The the whole thing of circumcision, who should be circumcised and and uh, who doesn't have to be circumcised, you know, some division was sown here. The subject came up because of false brothers. Uh, so these are uh, believers that are just trying to make, make a fuss, make trouble, you know, pit people against each other. Secretly brought in, who did sneak in and spy out our freedom, which we have in Christ Jesus, so they could reduce us to slavery and legalism, but to whom we did not yield for an instant to the subjection, so that the truth of the gospel would remain permanently with you. So this is what you have to be careful of uh, in in life: is that you know people are, uh, people will try to sow division. People will try to uh, cl make claims that you know they are being attacked by this one or that one, or they're they're being, uh, um, you know, so someone is someone is out to get them, or this this type of thing. But 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 really, you, you just you just have to steer clear of all of that division. You just have to keep your eye on the gospel. And then once you've believed in the gospel for eternal life, then keep your eye on obedience, obedience to Jesus' ways and obedience to his spirit. And all of these false brothers who show up and are really jealous that you have the peace and the calm and the prosperity of Christ in you, you know, you just, you know, you forgive them and you move on. You just, you don't make an issue of it. You just move on. Because what these, these these false brothers are trying to do is to reduce you to slavery in legalism, the, uh, legalism uh, somehow being judgmental of other people, being unforgiving of other people, just just wanting to f you know reducing faith to following a bunch of rules and, and you know doing it for the wrong reasons and this sort of thing. So you don't you don't want to get involved in that, uh, no matter what, whether you're a Jewish or Gentile believer, you don't you don't want to get involved in that, and you don't want to get involved in trying to. To divide people, and it is it is true, and the, the the point that was made, I think, is is true that sometimes we look at certain scriptures and based on our own study and our own uh, communication, uh, and you know what we've maybe learned from other people is you know we might uh, look at the same scripture, you know, a number of different people and have different interpretations what it means. I think that's fine. I think it's great, and it's great to have discussions, and but but you don't. You don't let yourself be divided as believers. I think that we're all looking for truth, and we just have to keep pressing forward and trying to find out, you know, what does Scripture really mean, and and what does it maybe, maybe not mean, or maybe God in some cases leaves the Scripture, you know, deliberately a little bit vague, so that there is kind of a discussion or further communication with God, you know, further revelation from the Holy Spirit. You know, we don't know. We don't know all the intricacies of God's design. So I think that. Uh, we, we should never let, uh, you know, different views of what a scripture says or what it means uh, divide us as believers in Jesus Christ. We have, to, uh, we have to preserve unity. It doesn't mean that you compromise your values. It doesn't mean that you go around saying that, uh, uh, you know, Jesus didn't die for our sins or something like that. You know, you, you know they're, they're, the, the gospel is a basic mes message. And then once you have embraced it and believed in it, then you live it uh, on a daily basis through study and application of the Word of God, but you don't want to get caught up in, uh, you know, f fighting over every point, which, uh, you know, unfortunately happens uh, happens in a lot of churches, and it's really, it's, it, it, it really is a, uh, uh, it's a, it's an obstacle to unity. And verse 6, but from those who think they are somebody, 
Uh, have you ever met anybody in life who thought they were somebody? I mean, uh, of course you have. I mean, we've probably all thought that of ourselves sometimes that we were somebody. That that's part of the idea of the crucifying the flesh once you've been saved is that you know you have to realize you know you're you're a sinner. You're nobody. You're saved by faith. Saved uh, by, by faith in Christ, and then you rely on His grace. But but Paul is making a very good point here. But from those who think they are somebody, of what sort they were formerly makes no difference to me. So, you know, some people will look at that and say, well, Paul is being arrogant. Well, okay, have it your way. If you think he's being arrogant, I think he's, I think he's really stepping out in faith and in courage and saying that, you know, n n none of us uh, really, uh, none of us is really uh, anybody special. That uh, we're all saved by faith in Christ and we all have to rely on God's grace. But on the contrary, when they, they saw... Of what sort they were formerly makes no difference to me. God does not show partiality, or sometimes a God is no respecter of persons. I think that's that's a, a very common translation in, in um, many versions of the of the English language Bible. Uh, there's an e uh, a Hebrew idiom that uh, that means take the appearance of a man. God does not take the appearance of a man, but basically this is what it means. It means that God does not uh, God does not play favorites. For those who think they are something imparted nothing to me. So that's, you know, that's telling it like it is. But on the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted the gospel for the uncircumcised, this is this was Paul's calling, was to teach it to the to the, the non-Jewish believers, just as Peter with the circumcised, who was to teach to the Jews, for the one God who worked in Peter in an apostleship for the circumcision for Jewish people also worked in me to the heathens. So everyone has their portion. You know, Paul was taught, uh, was given the assignment to teach to one group and Peter the other group. And since they knew the grace that was given to me, Jacob and Peter and John, those who are reputed to be pillars, did pledge mutual fellowship with me and Barnabas so that we would go to the heathens, go to the, 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 uh, the Gentiles, non-Jewish uh, unbelievers and unbelievers when they want to learn the word of God. So here there's, um, there's a, a unity pact that these five people make because you have Paul and Barnabas on the one hand who've really been entrusted with the word to, to, uh, to uh, Gentiles and then you have the other three who were entrusted with the word to Jews and now they're going to join forces and they're, they're all going to go to the to the heathens to the to the Gentiles and teach them the word. So it's it's a show, uh, it's a show of unity. And they to the circumcision. Three of them were uh, Jewish teachers, to, teachers to Jewish people as well. They only asked that we would remember the poor, which I was eager to do. So the the five of them made this pact, and the three of them said, "Yes, let's just remember the poor." And Paul says, "Yes, I was eager to do that." And that's a good reminder to us that really. Uh, the, 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 the gospel and the word of God really are for, for the poor, right? I mean, not just the poor uh, in terms of money, but the, the poor of spirit, the poor, um, uh, you know, mentally, emotionally. If you're suffering from any kind of poverty, really uh, health, some kind of health deficit, the, the answer is the gospel and the word of God. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, believe and study and apply the word of God. But when Peter came to Antioch, I resisted him to his face because he was being accused by the uncircumcised. So uh, Peter was having some kind of issue with the uh, with the the non-Jewish believers that he was associated with. For before some came from Jacob, he ate together with the heathens. So Peter was eating with the non-Jewish, with the Gentiles who had converted. But when they came, he was withdrawing and separating himself, fearing those from the circumcision. So see what is happening here, and this is what the issue is with Paul, is that Peter is starting to behave differently. He was communicating in a free way with uh, Gentiles, and then Jewish people showed up, and he thought they wouldn't like that, so he withdrew from them. Uh, he withdrew from the Gentiles. So, you know, Paul is going to call him out on this, that, you know, he really shouldn't have changed his behavior like that. And, you know, if you're, if you're telling people to live one way, and then you live... Uh, you know, you don't live that way. You know that that's a problem. I mean, if you if that is, it's one thing to say something, but then if you don't do it, I mean, it's that that does create a credibility problem. And the uh, rest of the Jewish people also played the hypocrite with him. So then, even Barnabas was carried away with them in hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not walking straight with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of all. If you Jewish people are acting like the heathens and do not indeed live like Jewish people should, you don't live by faith and you're not, uh, you're not um, 
welcoming of other people, how can you compel the heathens to live like Jewish people should? So you you know you you say you're a believer, but you don't you know you're snubbing other people, and you really uh, you, you shouldn't be doing that. We are natural Jewish people and not sinners from the heathens. But, but, since we know that man is not justified because of works of tradition, but only through faith in Christ Jesus, we too have believed in Messiah so that we would be made righteous by faith in him and not by works of legalism, because no one will be made righteous by works of legalism. So there it is there, is that uh, the uh, righteousness uh, comes by faith. It doesn't come... Uh, by a legalistic system or, you know, uh, unforgiveness. Now, faith without works is dead. I think you have to keep that in mind as well. Uh, but uh, you're not made righteous by works. You're made righteous by faith in Christ Jesus. And that's, that's, a, very, uh, that's a, critical, uh, a critical point, is that you're in the right relationship with God when you believed in Jesus Christ by faith. But if, while we seek to be made righteous in... Uh, Christ then are found to be sinners, then is Messiah a servant of sin? God forbid. For if I build again these things which I destroyed, I have established myself a transgressor. I believed in Jesus Christ, I walked away from sin, and then I came back to sin. So I've made myself, I was uh, saved before I had eternal life. You know, I've, in my lifestyle, I've gone back to what I was before I, I had eternal life. I still have it, but I've gone back to the way I was before. So, you know, God can't bless that. I mean, he has saved you, but he can't bless that as a lifestyle. For I died through the teaching, I died to legalistic tradition, so that I shall live for God. I've been crucified with Messiah, then I no longer live, but he, Messiah lives in me. But now, although I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, the one who loves me and has given himself over on my behalf. So I still live in my human body, but I live by faith in the Son of God, the one who loves me and has given himself over on my behalf. I did not cancel the grace of God, for if I am righteousness in righteousness through legalism, then Messiah died in vain, then Christ died on the cross in vain, uh, if we're claiming to be righteous through, uh, through legalism, which is really being judgmental and really just wanting to follow rules without faith, uh, being, <coughs> pardon me, having an unforgiving spirit and unforgiving nature, an unforgiving uh, attitude. Uh, th these these are the things that, that we should avoid. So the bottom line is everybody is saved by faith in Christ. It doesn't matter what you're, whether you're Jewish or Gentile, what your background is. Once you believe that Christ died for your sins, he shed his blood for you, then you're saved. And it doesn't matter whether you're Jewish or so-called, you know, pagan or heathen or Gentile, or I think uh, I would normally like to just say non-Jewish. But uh, there are other terms that are sometimes you see in the biblical translations. Uh, so, so that's Galatians two. So those are a few principles. Uh, there are a few principles that come from that, and I'll, I'll go over them a little bit, and then I'll uh, talk a little bit about the veil because here we see an example of a veil. A veil can be physically something that you put on your face or put on your head, uh, but it can also be something in a in a metaphoric sense, just, you know, an, an image of something that is hidden, something that is a mystery or a secret or something that you are ignorant of. You know, you've put, uh, you've put a veil between yourself and, and God. You're just, you're, you, you've decided that you don't want to be, um, you, you don't want to know the, the, the truth of the word of God. There's, there's a veil. It doesn't mean you've put something on your face, but it means you've established a barrier or an obstacle between yourself and God. So uh, Paul did that by changing his, his attitude, changing his way of living. When he thought the Jews would be unhappy that he was communicating with Gentiles, he stopped communicating with Gentiles. He was trying to be a people pleaser instead of a God pleaser. So that created a problem. So anyway, uh, regarding Galatians 2, uh, one, one point I would make is just the, the first obvious point that Jews are physically circumcised and Gentiles are not required to be. That's simple enough. Uh, God is no respecter of persons. He's not partial. Both uh, Jewish and Gentiles need faith in the gospel, but many are jealous of the liberty that it gives. And I think that's something that you've probably seen uh, in your life if you've really made a commitment uh, to a life uh, of faith in Jesus Christ and in the Word of Christ, uh, it gives you a, a calm and a peace. Uh, and when other people see that in this world of great 
you know, agitation and, and tension. And, you know, we were just talking about it at the start with, uh, with Perry, when you're in a, in a world like that and somebody sees uh, a person that looks like, you know, he's not buffeted by that, you know, he's just, he, he's, he's calm in the storm, you know, that actually kind of, that can scare people that, that, that can turn them off. You know, they, they don't, they're jealous of that liberty. I mean, that's really what their problem is, is that, is that they don't like the fact that somebody else can cope, has found a way to cope with something that they themselves can't cope with. And I know that sounds like a very tough message, but really God is no respecter of persons. If one person can have faith and one person can have blessings, then another one can, you know? So it's the, so the person who receives that peace and prosperity from God, uh, you know, it's fine, you can be jealous of that, you know, you can attack it, you can do anything you want to it, but really, why not just say, I could have that too, how do I have that, how do I get that, you know, and this is what a lot of people don't want to do, because they're just caught in this, this, this box of their own mentality of enslavement, you know, and they don't, they don't want to get out of that for some reason, they're just, they're, they're, un, they're, they're unable or unwilling, it's a decision of free will in the end, but they're just un, unwilling to make the decision to get out of that, that box of, of slavery, really, they don't want to go into a life of uh, liberty and freedom and joy in, uh, in Jesus Christ. Another point is Paul and Barnabas taught Gentiles while James, Peter, and John taught Jews, but these three would also preach to Gentiles with Paul and Barnabas. They made that pact of unity of the five that they would all preach to the Gentiles. So that's when Peter started doing that uh, and then the Jews showed up, he stopped communicating with the Gentiles, uh, as we said before, because he thought that the Jewish people wouldn't like it. And Peter then behaved like the Gentiles, hypocritically veiled from the truth and from grace. And there was tension with Paul over this situation because God is no respecter of persons. So Peter should not have snubbed the circumcision. He should not have snubbed Jewish people even if they snubbed him. I mean, that's you, you, you don't repay evil with evil. If, if you're, that's, and that's really the message of forgiveness, isn't it? Is that uh, um, forgiveness... Um, if you if you can't forgive someone, and I think that uh, you know others have made the points a very good point that really forgiveness is a mental decision. It's a it's a mental decision that you're going to let God handle the person who hurt you, and it doesn't mean you have to have any contact or association with that person. If they do happen to ask you for forgiveness, of course you forgive them. They might not. They probably won't in many cases, but that's fine. You're always ready to forgive if they ask. But really, forgiveness is a mental decision that you're going to let God handle the person who hurt you. And if you don't make that decision, if you make the decision to have the same emotions that they have had against you, some kind of anger or bitter bitterness or desire for revenge, whatever it is, then God has to um, he he has to deal with your disobedient behavior as he does with the disobedient behavior of the person who hurt you. Now I'm not getting into anything like triple compound discipline so so you know you don't have to worry about that those of you who uh, who are sensitive to that. Uh, that's not what I'm talking about but if you don't forgive and you go back into that same emotional area that the person who hurt you was involved in. Well, you know, God, God has to, God being no respecter of persons, he has to deal with you just like he has to deal with the person who hurt you. So that's why it's better to make the mental decision to, uh, to forgive. And uh, so really, but what Peter was trying to repay, you know, one unkindness with another is that, you know, he was being snubbed. And so he thought that, you know, he should, you know, maybe, uh, maybe snub someone else, you know, he, sh he should not hang out with the Gentiles because otherwise he was going to be snubbed by the Jews and, and he couldn't take that. And, you know, uh, uh, so sometimes you have that too. I, I don't know if you've ever noticed uh, in your comings and goings where you go and when you associate with different groups of people, but sometimes, uh, have you ever noticed that someone treats you a certain uh, uh, way and then they treat other people a different way? They, I mean, they're, they're, they behave differently when you're around. You know, they'll treat, they, they might treat you one way, but then they'll say something else about you when you're not around. Or when somebody enters the room, you know, everybody changes the way they behave and they try to cater to that person who's entered the room. They, they behave differently. Well, that biblically, that's, that's hypocrisy, but that we see examples of that everywhere. I mean, there's no question uh, that uh, uh, of people that's, that pretend something and then the reality comes out later in some kind of different, different way. But the Bible says that that, that really isn't uh, that, that isn't really a unified soul. That really isn't the personality that God wants for us. He wants us to be uh, consistently uh, 
showing his character and his integrity and his virtue in, in all relationships. And, and that means really to be, uh, to be, you know, decent with everybody and to, to, you know, to try to get along with other people in as much as it depends on you. Sometimes they don't want to get along with you. And, and then that's when you just have to say, okay, that's, that's it. You don't want to, I, I can see you don't want to get along with me, your decision, but it, it does commit you uh, when you follow Christ, you know, it does commit you to behave a certain way towards other people, uh, e even when you know that there's something wrong with that. You know that there's something wrong with that, but you do, you do have to just say, well, okay, maybe I'll have to walk away from it, or maybe there's some way we can find to communicate, but there is, you know, we, we, do, have a, we do have a clash here. I'm going to stand on my principles, and you do what you have to do. Uh, and that's a hard way to live. I mean, if you... If you uh, uh, go to certain places and associate with certain people, you're going to see that living, living that way is not, uh, it's not an easy thing, you know, but that's what, that, that's how God develops us and that's how he wants us to live. He wants us to live consistently under his principles, under his uh, sense of integrity and character and virtue. Another point from Galatians 2 is our justification is from grace and in righteousness, uh, in crucifixion of the flesh, and our justification doesn't come from the hypocrisy of the law of sin and death. In other words, once we're saved, we don't have to go back to sin. <coughs> if we go back to sin, then th that's really hypocritical because we, we've said that we've committed ourselves to one thing and we go back to another. And when we do sin, we have uh, confession. So, you know, you can, God is very gracious, but that it's, that's not saying that you should just sin. No, no we, we, that the whole point of the blood was to show that we are able to turn away from sin. You know, God has made it possible for us to make a decision to turn away from sin. If we choose Christ, we're not supposed to go back to sin. And, and, this, and, and this, this hypocrisy, this separation of us from God, this is one manifestation of the veil. It's not putting a veil on your head, but it is, it is something that blocks or hides or you know, makes it more difficult to have contact with. And finally, the purpose of teaching the gospel is to help the poor spiritually and physically. So that, that, that really is it. I was making uh, the point before that, uh, that the, the, gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ and then living in the word that you do after believing in the gospel, that it, it's, it really is designed to eliminate poverty. You know, I mean, uh, you know, there are international organizations that have all kinds of, you know, poverty reduction programs or poverty eradication programs. Uh, but really, the, the way, if you want to eliminate poverty in all its forms, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and live according to his word and you know you, you you will see prosperity and it doesn't mean that you're going to have a million dollars in the bank I don't have a million dollars in the bank and probably never will that's not the point the point is your needs are met and you have peace and calm and you know and God meets your needs because uh, he has a plan for you and so whatever that plan is for you he is obligated to fund it He's obligated to meet your needs. That's why it's pointless to work about to worry about money. If you're truly a you know a Christian who 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 follows Jesus Christ and really believes it, it really is pointless to worry about money because, look, God has a plan for you. Now, why is He going to have some kind of plan for you and not not fund it appropriately? So maybe you didn't understand what the real plan is. You gotta you gotta be in communication with Him and pray and get revelation. What is His plan for my life? And then God will provide. You know, that's it. Sometimes these two things are not harmonized. They're not in harmony. They're not in sinuous plan. They think it's great, but it's really their plan. And then they wonder why they don't have money for it. You know, and that's, you know, we, we see that in ministries all the time is that, you know, that uh, people are, are saying, you know, give, 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 give. Okay. I mean, that, that, it's fine that a believer should give. That's a very important thing in the life of a Christian. But sometimes, uh, the reason why there's not money is, you know, God is trying to tell you something. God's trying to tell you maybe, you know, you're trying to get all this money to do all these things that are not really what I'm asking you to do. Sometimes you have to just get back in communication with God and find out what is he asking me to do. And then God will, will fund that. You know, he'll, he, will not, he will make it possible. So, uh, okay, that's Galatians 2. Now it's 11 o'clock. I'll go a little bit more uh, just to talk a little bit about the, uh, the veil. Uh, it's 11 o'clock Eastern time, uh, 10 o'clock Central, I guess. The, the veil, um, there's an exa the example here is that Peter's uh, behavior, there was, a, there was a, an obstacle, there was something in between him and God because of this hypocritical behavior of snubbing someone because he was worried he was going to be snubbed by other people. So uh, 
But in, in the Bible, uh, some concrete examples of the veil would be, for example, you know, Rebecca wore one when first she met uh, Isaac. So, you know, when you meet your future husband, you wear a veil, and that's your way of saying, you know, I'm the one that uh, I've been set aside for you. You know, I, I'm, you know, we are, we are bride and groom, and eventually we will be husband and wife. That's you're the one for me. Uh, but also in the Bible, it's, it's funny too if you check passages like uh, Song of Solomon, one seven, uh, and Ezekiel. 13, around verses 15 to 20, 20, 21, somewhere in there, uh, veils were also worn by prostitutes and female sorcerers. So there are different types of veils and they, they, uh, they convey different messages. So they're sort of the, the, the God-oriented and the not, the not God-oriented, but there are different reasons for wearing veils and different types of veils. Veils can communicate uh, wealth and status. Isaiah 3, 13, 25. And they can also communicate sorrow and disgrace if you read the story of, uh, you know, Haman trying to eliminate the Jewish race in the book of Esther, which is really the basis for the Jewish holiday of Purim, uh, Feast of Lots. Uh, that's, that, this is, uh, th there was a veil uh, in that story, and, and, you know, I'm not going to take the time to go over it right now, but Esther, uh, uh, the sixth, uh, chapter six and, and following. If you read that story, uh, the veil, uh, there certainly was a, a, you know, a huge veil in the eyes of Haman, who was openly uh, uh, anti-Semitic, uh, anti and, uh, and disgrace. The, the veil was, a, a, that veil, that obstacle was really a sign of disgrace because he wanted to eliminate uh, God's chosen people. And that, that plot was foiled, and that was what, uh, that's what uh, people give thanks for at Purim, was that this, this, uh, this first major anti-Semitic uh, uh, plot, you know, was was foiled, and the Jewish race was uh, was spared. Um, in the Holy of Holies, uh, between the Holy of Holies and the rest of the temple, there was a veil, a very thick veil, and it was actually torn down. It was rent after Christ uh, shed his blood. In the local temple, the veil was brought down, and, and so then that was to show that there really doesn't have to be any obstacle between the Holy of Holies and the rest of the temple, between God and between man. Uh, Moses uh, wore a veil um, to, sh to show that when he spoke with God, that his face shone, his face lit up, and then because of that direct communication with God, and then it went away when he, he was not speaking to God, so he went to, he, he wore a veil to hide that. And then you've got, um, and I'll read one passage and then close, you've got um, the, the veil as a symbol showing uh, a sad heart or just closed eyes and just not being very receptive to, to God, just wanting to, to hide from God. And I'll just take this time, I'll go to Isaiah, uh, 44, I guess it will be, and then I'll, I'll read a passage and comment a little bit and then close. 44, Isaiah 44, 14. He hews down cedars and takes the cypress and the oak, which he strengthens for himself among the trees of the forest. He plants an oak, and the rain nourishes it. Then it will be for a man to burn, for he will take it and warm himself. Yes, he kindles it and bakes bread. Yes, he makes a god and worships it. He makes it a graven image and bows down to it. And this, I believe, here was a man worshiping a piece of wood. But this is this is the, the ultimate veil. Is when you put, uh, is when you worship a false god. You're putting the, the ultimate, the, the, the ultimate obstacle between yourself and God. He burns half of it in the fire. With half of it, he eats flesh. He roasts the roast and is satisfied. Yes, he warms himself and says, "Aha! I am warm. I've seen the fire." And the residue of it he makes a god, the ashes, the wood, his graven image. He bows down to it and worships and is praying to it and says, Deliver me, for you are my god. And of course, the Lord God cannot, cannot bless that because you are worshipping a false god or an idol. They have not known or understood. He, God, has shut their eyes so they cannot see, their hearts so they cannot understand. Well, he did that because of their decision to be disobedient. He said, okay, I see where you're going with this. So he shut. He actually shut their eyes so they could not see in their hearts so they cannot understand because they've, they've committed the ultimate act of disobedience. And, and, and God is, is punishing them for that. God is holding them accountable for that. 
and no one considers in his heart, nor is there knowledge or understanding to say, I have burned half of it in the fire. Yes, I have also baked bread upon its coals. I have roasted flesh and eaten, and will I make the residue of it an abomination? So worshiping anyone but the Lord God through faith in Christ is an abomination. And, and God, when, they, when you see passages like, you know, God is a jealous God, it's not jealous in the way a human would be jealous. It's jealous in the sense that God is telling you, don't have other gods except for me. Will I bow down to a block of wood? He feeds on ashes. A deceived heart has turned him aside. So God cannot deliver his soul or say, is there not a lie, a false God in my right hand? So once you've gone so far away from God, you know, you're, you're, you always have the possibility of coming back, but some people's thinking gets so corrupted that they, 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 they through their own decision-making, they make it impossible for themselves to come back to God. It's not that God wouldn't let them. It's that through their own decision-making, they, they just they, they put this big veil that blinds them uh, to God. And, and it's not that God doesn't want them, but he holds us accountable. And you, you can reach the point in life where you get so far away from God that it's just... You know, coming back to that that way of thinking and that action and that lifestyle, it's 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 very very hard. Remember these things, O Jacob and Israel, for you are my servant. I have formed you. You are my servant, O Israel. You will not be forgotten by me, my God. I have erased your transgressions as a thick cloud and your sins as a cloud. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. So God always wants you back. You know, if you are already, let's say you're a believer and you've you've gone away from the, the that lifestyle, God always wants you back. And he wants you in. He wants you to have eternal life to start. But then when you, you stray after that, he's, he, he always he, he's saying, you know, I've redeemed you. You know, there's something that's been done. There's something that's been established established in the in eternity past if you want to put it that way is that this that this idea that sin has been taken care of and later the messiah jesus christ would come to, to to prove that to shed his blood sin is taken care of you can you can turn away from sin sing O you heavens for the lord has done it shout you lower parts of the earth break forth into singing you mountains, O forest, and every tree in it, for the Lord has redeemed Jacob and glorified himself in Israel. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, and he who formed you from the womb, I am the Lord who makes all things. And, and there you go, who formed you, you, who formed you from the womb. So I think it's, uh, to me, that's another one, uh, like in the start of uh, Jeremiah, there's a verse, I think it shows pr pretty much that God is saying, this is you in the womb. So if you kill that being in the womb, I don't know if it's legal murder according to humans, but it's not according to God. It's not to be done according to God. I am the Lord who makes all things, who alone stretches forth the heavens, who spreads abroad the earth by myself, who frustrates the tokens of the liars and makes diviners mad, who turns wise men backward, who think they're wise themselves, and makes their knowledge foolish, who confirms the word of his servant and performs the counsel of his messengers, who says to Jerusalem, you will be inhabited, there will be people of faith. And to the cities of Judah, you will be built, and I shall raise up its ruined places. Who says to the deep, be dry, and I shall dry up your rivers. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and will perform all my pleasure. Even saying to Jerusalem, you will be built, and to the temple, the temple, your foundation, will be laid. Thank you, Father, for this uh, time together. Thank you for your word. Thank you for an opportunity to be in the Word. Bless this message to your service and watch out for all of us. Uh, be with us all today, all associated with this ministry, teaching and listening, and help us reach out to a lost and dying world. Help us be salt and light. Uh, watch us in the days and weeks ahead. Uh, bless this message to your service. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Stephen. Appreciate it, brother.